Well, you have quite an audience. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2012 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Mr. Joseph Sanchez. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Joe is a preparation technician here at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Joe grew up in Port Perry, Ontario. He obtained his bachelor's degree from the University of Toronto, majoring in both biology and paleontology. Subsequently, Joe moved to Ottawa to pursue his master's degree in paleontology at Carleton University. For his thesis, Joe studied early late Cretaceous fossil bird remains from Saskatchewan. While pursuing his studies, Joe worked at the Royal Tyrrell Museum during the summers as a gallery interpreter, and upon completing his thesis, he was hired as a full-time technician in order to prepare the small and delicate remains of fossil mammals. Today, Joe will be discussing the results of his research on the Cretaceous bird remains from Saskatchewan. The fossils belong to an extinct group of foot-propelled diving birds called Hesperornithiforms. Joe will show us what the Saskatchewan fossils tell us about the early evolution of Hesperornithiforms, specifically about their diving ability. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Joe Sanchez. Thank you, Francois, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for coming out today. The title of my talk is Diving Birds from the Prairies, Late Cretaceous Hesperniciforms from the Pasquay Hills of Saskatchewan. And as Francois mentioned, these, this was the basis of my thesis, my master's thesis at Carleton University in Ottawa. So I think a good place to start off with is what are Hesperniciforms? And what you might have been able to guess from the title and the picture here they are diving birds. Specifically, they are foot-propelled diving birds that live during the late Cretaceous. And by being foot-propelled, this means that it was only the tarsal metatarsus and the phalanges, just the, the lower part of the leg, that were propelling them through the water. And the femur and the tibiotarsus stayed relatively stationary. They were first discovered by the famous fossil hunter O.C. Marsh in 1870 in Kansas. So here are two of his original uh, diagrams of the animal. And something that you'll notice is that these birds did have teeth. Another interesting fact about Hesperniciforms is their wing. These birds were so specialized for foot-propelled diving that their wing had become extremely reduced and pretty much useless. For most Hesperniciform species, we know nothing below the humerus, the upper part of the wing. So as I mentioned, they lived during the late Cretaceous. So here we have a paleogeographic map re representing uh, during the Cretaceous. Oh, sorry. And all those stars represent areas that we have discovered Hesperniciforms. And they're found throughout North America, parts of Europe and Asia, and a possible find as well in Chile. And they're mostly found in marine deposits with a couple of freshwater finds as well. In North America, they're generally found along the Western Interior Seaway. And the Western Interior Seaway, at its greatest extent, uh, split North America in two during the Creta late Cretaceous, connecting uh, the nowadays Arctic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, or the prehistoric Boreal and Tethian Oceans. My specimen is found, would have been found right along the eastern margin of the Western Interior Seaway in current Saskatchewan. So the locality that we get our specimens from is found along the Bainbridge River in Saskatchewan. It's right along the border, uh, right next to Manitoba. And it's found in the Pasquia Hills. And the Pasquia Hills is the most northern portion of the Manitoba Escarpment. And the Manitoba Escarpment, right along here, represents the eastern er erosional margin from the western interior seaway. So there's our Bainbridge River locality. Another locality that I will uh, talk about a little bit is this Carrot River locality located 100 kilometers southwest from the Bainbridge River locality. This is another important locality because it also contains Hesperniciforms of a similar age to the ones that we find at the Bainbridge River. So a little bit about the stratigraphy. Our bird bones are found in a bone bed in the Belfort member of the Asheville Formation. 
So it's about mid Cenomanian, about 95 million years ago. And it was believed to be deposited from a mid Cenomanian sea level low stand event followed by a transgression. So there we have the bone bed. Here's a picture of our locality right along the Bainbridge River. It's about a half an hour hike through dense woods and rivers. So once we get there, we're pretty wet. But there's a pretty uh, extensive outcrop along this area. Here's another picture. As I mentioned, our bone bed is found in the Asheville Formation, so it's only the lower part of this outcrop. And there's a lot of slumping that's occurred in this area. We get a lot of erosion. The bone bed does occur about two meters below this bentonite layer right here. So here we have the bone bed in situ. It does occur in lenses. Something else that you might be able to spot in this picture is just below the bone bed, there is a layer of mollusk shells, uh, specifically of the species Australoboletae. And this Australoboletae bed is a known recognized marker bed for mid Cenomanian throughout the western interior. So this helps us state the bones as well. A lot of the bone bed was actually found in the river. It's been eroded out of the, uh, of the outcrop there and it's floated down the river a bit. So a lot of our blocks came from float. So here I have a close up of one of the blocks. And we can see just how fossiliferous it is. It's just packed with fossil material. Here's another picture. See how densely compacted it is. And we get lots and lots of different types of fossils in here. Just to point out a few, of course, we have some bird bones, lots and lots of shark teeth. We get marine reptile material as well, uh, turtles and plesiosaurs, lots of bony fish material, and we get coprolites or fossilized dung. So to get on to what the purpose of my project was, we recovered about 300 bird bones from from this Bainbridge River locality. And these bone bo bird bones were disarticulated and randomly dispute, distributed amongst these other fossils, like the shark teeth and fish other bony fish material that I talked about and the marine reptile material. The eject my objective was to identify the bird bones, specifically those from the order Hesperniciform, and then see what these Hesperniciforms tell us about the early evolution of the group. Now, the reason why this was important is because the Hesperniciforms from this locality, as well as the Carrot River locality that I mentioned earlier, are the oldest known Hesperniciforms in North America. This Bainbridge locality also has the largest, no, largest accumulation of bird bones known from North America as well. And because of this, it's going to add greatly to our knowledge of the early evolution of this group and to the general knowledge of birds at this time. So we already have a time chart. We can see that Hesperniciforms are known all the way to the end of the Cretaceous, late Maastrichtian, back to the late Cenomanian, early Albanian. Now, as I mentioned, our Hesperniciforms are the oldest in North America, as long with those from the Carrot River locality, and they're second oldest known in the world. There is a site in England near Cambridge that does have older material, and it's a bird called Analiornis, and I'll talk a little bit about him a bit later. So once I was done preparing these fossil, uh, fossil bird bones out of the blocks, and by being done, I mean I was told to stop preparing them, because I spent the first six months of my master's thesis pretty much pre preparing these bird bones out of the blocks, and we had lots of more material to deal with, but if I kept preparing, I'd probably still be doing my masters right now. So we had over 300 bird bones prepared. From these bird bones, we found at least probably four species of Hesperniciform. Two were previously known, Paschiornis tankii and Paschiornis hardii. Then we had one new species of Paschiornis probably, and then another new species of Hesperniciform, possibly a new genus. For the rest of this talk, I'm really going to be focusing on the genus Passionis, specifically those two previously known species, Passionis hardii and tankii. Hardii being the smaller, and tankii being the larger of these two species. 
Now they are only, they're only us known and were first described at that Carrot River locality that I mentioned earlier. But they were only described off a few bones. There was, they had a couple femurs, a couple tarsi metatarsi, and only the distal ends of the humerus. From the Bainbridge River locality, we get a much more complete picture of what this bird would have looked like. We find a lot of different skull material, like the frontal. We get the maxilla. We get lower jaw material, the ramus and dentary. We find lots and lots of teeth. I was actually uh, told by another paleontologist that looks at uh, late Cretaceous bird bones, uh, Dr. Larry Martin, that this that our area probably has the most the most bird teeth that he's ever seen in one locality. So lots and lots of bird teeth we found. We get bird vertebra. We get shoulder girdle material like the scapula and coracoid. We get the complete humerus, and so not just the distal end that they found at the Carrot River locality. And we get lower wing material as well, the ulna, radius, and carpal metacarpus. We find pelvic material, lower leg, like the tibia tarsus, fibula, femur, and then the foot material, the tarsum metatarsus, and the phalanges. So this chart just gives you a picture of just how much material that we found. Excuse me. So we had a lot of material to work with from Passiornis so that we could make a more complete description of this bird. Now from our description, something became very obvious, uh, obvious to me while I was working on this bird. And that is that Passiornis seems to be a lot less specialized for foot propelled diving than later species of Hesperniciform. And so I'm gonna go over five points now I'm going to talk about robustness, I'm going to look over their wing, leg position and movement, talk about toe rotation, and then see if this bird was doing a slightly different form of locomotion than we see in later Hesperniciforms. So first of all, robustness. In Hesperniciforms, their bones are quite robust, especially their leg, their leg bones, the femur, tibia tarsus, and the tarsal metatarsus. Now this extreme robustness helps create lar these large areas for muscle attachment to make them very strong foot propelled divers. So here we have a, oops, sorry, a series of Hesperniciform femurs. So we have Hesperornis regulus, which was that first species that was described by O.C. Marsh. Hesperornis gracilis and Hesperornis, all later species of Hesperniciform. And they have very robust femurs compared to that of Paschiornis. A good example would be with Parahesperornis and Paschiornis tankii. Their femurs are very similar in length, but Parahesperornis is much more robust, it has much wider femur, much larger areas for muscle attachment compared to that of Paschiornis. Another example, looking at the, the tarsal metatarsi, here again we have Hesperornis regulus, gracilis, Parahesperornis, we also have Baptornis, all later species of Hesperniciform. And again, just seeing a much more robust tarsal metatarsis than we're getting in Paschiornis. Interesting enough here, we, ha we do have the distal end of the tarsal metatarsis of Analiornis. And it's actually very, s and Analiornis was that species that I mentioned that was actually older than our Paschiornis. And it seems that it is very similar in robustness to that of Paschiornis. So that kind of goes along with that some of these earlier species may have been less, were less robust and may have been less specialized than later Hesperniciforms for foot propelled diving. The next point I want to talk about is their wing. As I mentioned in that second slide, Hesperniciforms had become so specialized for foot propelled diving that their wings had become extremely, extremely reduced. So here we have the humerus of Hesperornis, 
And we know nothing below the, the humor nothing below the humerus. We have no lower wing bones of this bird, and that's a, similar for most other species of Hesperniciform, with the exception of Bacteornis, one of those other species that I talked about. Uh, we do find the ulna, and I'll show you a picture of that ulna later. That ulna is still extremely reduced compared to other birds. However, oh, sorry. So here we have uh, two typical later Hesperniciform humeri of Parahesperornis and Bacteronis. And they are very stick-like, extremely reduced. If you were to place it next to a typical bird humerus, it would be hard to tell that that's what it was. It's lacking those, the bicipital and delto, deltoid, deltopectoral crests that you see in a typical bird, bird humerus for muscle attachments. So extremely reduced. However, the humerus of Paschiornis is much less, is much more of a typical looking humerus. It has a well developed de deltopectoral crest along here, very well developed bicipital crest, and I could put humerus there. So a much more typical looking bird humerus in Paschiornis, much less reduced. If we look at the distal end of the humerus, here we have the distal end from Bacteriornis, one of those later species. And there is no distinguishable condyles at the distal end there for the articulation with the ulna and radius. However, in Paschiornis, there are two very distinct condyles here. So again, much less reduced than that of later Hesperniciforms. Then we look at the lower wing bones. As I mentioned before, we don't even know the lower wing bones for most other Hesperniciforms. So the presence of these bones at all show a um, make their wing less reduced. But when we look at the radius ulna, carpal metacarpus, and the manual phalanx, they are much more typical looking of your average bird. So a much less reduced lower wing. Here's that ulna uh, from Bacteornis that I had mentioned. So we do get uh, some lower wing material from Hesperniciforms. Now Bacteornis was a bird that was probably a bit larger than Paschiornis tankii, the larger of the two species of Paschiornis. However, its ulna is much smaller than that of Paschiornis tankii, so extremely reduced ulna. So a question this brings up is, with Paschiornis having this much more complete uh, wing, could Paschiornis fly? We know that later Hesperniciforms could not fly with that extremely extremely reduced humerus and wing with not even having lower wing bones, this bird definitely could not fly. But Paschionis does have a more typical looking humerus, or a typical, more, more typical looking wing. And my answer to that is maybe. Maybe. Um, and the reason, the reason I can't give a, a complete answer is that we're missing a very important bone from Paschionis that would be able to let us know if it could fly or not, and that's the sternum. The reason the sternum is important here, we have a typical bird uh, sternum of a strong flyer there. Now the reason the sternum is important in determining if a bird can fly is this is where the, the important wing muscles for flight attach to, specifically along this large keel here along the sternum. Birds that are strong flyers usually have a very pronounced keel along the sternum, and this creates a, a good leverage point as well for the wings. We, we do know the sternum for other Hesperniciforms. Here we have the sternum of Parahesperornis, and there is no keel, there is no keel along the sternum. So again, these later Hesperniciforms definitely could not fly. But we do not know the sternum of Passionis. So until I find that, I don't, I can't really say 100% sure if Passionis could fly or not. Another thing to consider is the density of the bones of Passionis. Here we have a cross section of the femur of Passionis tankii. It has very thick cortical bone thickness. The cortical bone thickness of Passionis ranges from about 40 to 50 percent. Your typical bird bone, here's a cross section. It's very, very thin cortical bone thickness. And this is to lighten up the skeleton to make it easier for them to fly. 
A study done, uh, another study that I looked at done by Chimpsony et al. in 1998, they looked at a Cretaceous loon. And their Cretaceous loon had cortical bone thickness of about 37%. And he said because the bone density was so, was so great in this bird that it probably would not be able to fly. So if we went off that reasoning, then Pascagoras definitely couldn't fly with having cortical bone thickness of about 40 to 50%. I myself, until I find that sternum, I don't want to give a 100% uh, answer to that Pascagoras couldn't fly. But if it could, it probably wasn't a very strong flyer. It's gonna, it had a pretty heavy skeleton, so it probably wasn't a strong flyer. Next point I want to talk about is leg position and movement. Here we have a reconstruction of Hesperornis regulus. And you can see that its legs are articulating or lateral to the body, very similar to uh, a loon or a grebe. And this uh, helps create a very efficient movement through the water. The femur and tibia tarsus, when we look at the muscle attachments here, they were actually probably held relatively in place along that position. They probably couldn't move those, these bones very much further underneath their body. Now because of this and how far back their legs are on their body, they probably had a very hard time moving on land as well. And they might have moved very similar to some modern day loons when they're on land. They pretty much have to push themselves with their feet, kind of move like a, a seal would on land except put with their feet. However, with Pascuornis, their leg position is a bit different. So here I have some crude diagrams of a kind of a cross section through the body, cranial looking. So here would be the pelvis, the femur, and the tibia tarsus. So in, Hespor in Hesperornis and other later Hesperniciforms, the femur can sit uh, lateral to the body because the antitrochanter, part of the pelvis here, is not very pronounced. However, in Pasciornis, the antitrochanter is much more pronounced. And because of this, the femur would not be able to articulate directly lateral to the, to the pelvis. So it would be held further underneath the body. Something else to look at is the tibia tarsus. Here we have a typical tibia tarsus of other Hespernith, later Hesperniciforms. The distal condyles are slanted. And because of this, it causes the tibia tarsus to be directed dorsally while they are swimming. However, in Pasciornis, the distal condyles where it would articulate with the femur are more horizontal. And so the tibia tarsus would be held more straight along where the femur is. Now these, because, because of this, it's gonna create a different position of how it holds its leg. Pascornis was probably then a less efficient foot propelled diver. It can't hold its legs directly lateral to its body. However, it probably made it a bit easier for them to move on land with their legs being further underneath their body. They could probably form at least some type of waddling motion, similar to some to some loons and ducks. The next point I wanna talk about is toe rotation. In aquatic birds, they usually have uh, some type of, aquatic birds that will use their feet for motion in the water, they have to have some adaptation to create a larger surface area to propel themselves through the water with. A lot of birds will have webbed feet, so we have skin growing in between each toe to create a larger surface area. This is similar in, bo in loons and a lot of ducks and shorebirds. So in these birds, during their power stroke, as they're pushing themselves through the water, their toes will be spread apart to create that large surface area. And then during their recovery stroke, they will fold their toes backwards to reduce surface area and therefore drag. Some other birds, like grebes, have what we call lobed toes. So what happens here is that the skin around each individual toe is flattened and expanded to increase surface area. So when these birds went during their power stroke, their toes again are spread apart 
to increase that surface area. And with the little slots in between, it actually creates a bit of lift as well. And then during the recovery stroke, what happens is they actually rotate these toes 90 degrees to decrease surface area and therefore drag. And the ability for this can be seen in the morphology of the, of the toes. So here we're going to be looking at the distal end of phalanx 1 of digit 4. So here's the, the distal end of a loon. And a loon has web feet. The medial and the lateral ridges on the distal end of this toe are similar in size and parallel to each other. This allows only movement in that, in that one plane. It can move up and down. Here we have the distal end of the toe of a grebe, a type of bird that does have the ability to rotate their toe and has lobed toes. The medial ridge here is much more greatly enlarged than the lateral ridge and even starts to overlap it a bit. This allows the next toe in line to actually rotate around up to 90 degrees. And we see this in later Hesperornithiforms as well. So here we have the distal end of the toe of Hesperornis regulus, one of those later species of Hesperornithiform. And again, we get this greatly enlarged medial ridge compared to the lateral ridge, and even overlaps the lateral ridge more than it does in a grebe. So these birds definitely seem to have the ability to rotate their toes, have this extreme specialization. Here's another later species of Hesperornithiform, Baptorornis. Now, Baptorornis is somewhat in between a loon and a grebe. The medial ridge is slightly larger than the lateral ridge, and it's slanted. And um, so it's debated if Baptorornis would actually be able to rotate their toes or not. If it could rotate its toes, it probably had very limited ability to do so. Here we have the distal end of the toe of Paschiornis. Now, Paschiornis is much more similar looking to that of a loon. The medial ridge is similar in size, maybe a little bit larger than the lateral ridge, and they're pretty parallel to each other. So Paschiornis definitely could not rotate its toes. So it didn't, hadn't yet evolved this extreme specialization for toe rotation. Now, because of this, it might not even have lobed toes like we see probably in later Hesperornithiforms. Maybe its toes were webbed as well. So the next point I want to talk about is with all these differences in morphology that we're seeing, was Passiornis doing something different when it swam in the water? And for this, I looked at a study uh, done by Heinrich Verlag, Dr. Heinrich Verlag and uh, Dr. Matani. Uh, published in 2010, and in their study, they wanted, to, they wanted to see if they can predict the aquatic affinities in fossil birds using a multivariate analysis of skeletal features and locomotion of 245 extent species of bird. And the analysis they used was a regularized discriminant analysis, and generally what this is going to do is assign objects to one of several groups based on a set of measurements obtained from those objects. So the groups that they used in their study, or the categories, were foot-propelled divers, like loons and grebes, wing-propelled divers, like penguins and alcids, foot and wing-propelled divers, uh, like scooters and eiders, surface swimmers, like we see in a lot of ducks, plungers, and by plunger I mean birds that would be flying and then dive into the water, so they use gravity to propel themselves through the water. They don't use their feet or wings and then non-swimmers. So here's some of the results from their study. Now in their study they used five different fossil birds. Three of them were Hesperornithiforms. So we had Parahesperornis, Hesperornis, and Baptorornis, all later species of Hesperornithiform. And the analysis predicted that these birds would be foot-propelled divers. And you can see in morphospace they plot very well amongst the foot-propelled divers, all these triangles here. So when I did the analysis, I used the same uh, database with all the extent species that they did. Now I did two different analyses. The first one I did with just the species Pasteornis tankii. And the reason I did this is because we could get more of the important measurements from Pasteornis tankii than we could from Pasteornis hardii. So here the analysis predicted that Pasteornis tankii would be a foot-propelled diver. 
And this is understandable. It does have many features that you would see in full propelled divers. It has a very narrow hip. It has very narrow tarsal metatarsis. It has a very stout and posteriorly bowed femur, a double articulation with a femur with the antitrochanter and acetabulum on the pelvis as well. So it has lots of features of a foot propelled diver. But something interesting to note is where it plots in morphospace. It's right on the edge of the foot propelled divers and really more in between the wing propelled divers and the foot propelled divers. The next analysis I did was with both Passionis tankii and Passionis hardii. Now here we had less measurements to, to use and because of this, about 12% of extant species were misclassified. So they were put in the wrong, the, wrong, the wrong swimming groups. While if we compare that with the first analysis I did, only about 4% of extant species were misclassified. So this one isn't as strong. Now here, we have Passiornis tankii being predicted to be a surface swimmer and Passiornis hardii was predicted to be a plunger. Now when we look at how they plot in morphospace though, they kind of plot in between everything, in between the wing propelled divers and the foot propelled divers amongst the, the plungers and the surface swimmers and the, foot and, and the foot and wing propelled divers. So that's something interesting to note. So what do we get from the, what do we learn from the art, this analysis? And it seems to agree with our observations of the bo bone morphology that these, that Passiornis is less specialized for foot propelled diving than these later Hesperniciforms. It did have a much larger wing, so it's possible that it was using its wing to help propel itself through the water. Its legs are positioned further underneath its body, so maybe it was spending a bit more time uh, surface swimming. So the analysis does agree with our observations of the bone morphology. So just a, a quick conclusion from uh, what we're seeing from Pasciornis here. So all these, all these features that I mentioned are all pointing to Pasciornis to being a much less specialized foot propelled diver. It's lacking those, those strong specializations that we're seeing in later Hesperniciforms. So again, it's less robust, so it's lacking those large areas for muscle attachment that we're seeing in less Hesperniciform. So it pro was probably a much less, it probably was not as strong of a, a foot propelled diver as later Hesperniciforms. Its wings are less reduced, so it hadn't become so specialized for foot propelled diving that its wings had pretty much disappeared like we're seeing in later Hesperniciforms. And it's even possible that this bird might have been able to fly if at the least it probably was using its wings in some way to help it move through the water if not using them to propel, at least to uh, help steer themselves. Leg position and movement. So the legs, again, are situated further underneath the body, not directly lateral, so probably a little less efficient of a foot propelled diver. And, but because of this, had probably had an easier time moving on land. They lack that extreme specialization for toe rotation that we see in later Hesperniciforms. And the analysis done, that uh, regularized discriminant analysis also will show also shows that it probably was doing something a bit different as well with, with their locomotion. Now, as I mentioned, we did find some other species at this locality, a uh, possible new species of Pasciornis, and it's known from the Tarsometatarsis here. And this differs from other Pasci, the other species of Pasciornis by being slightly more robust than these other species. And if we look at the trochlea of the second metatarsal, it's, it's much more flared than it is in other species of Pasciornis. We also probably did find another new species of Hesperniciform, possibly a new genus yet to be described. And it's only known from the humerus. Now something interesting about this humerus as compared to other Pasciornis as the Pasciornis humerus at this area, that this humerus is slightly re is reduced. It's more of a typical Hesperniciform humerus. Now it's not as reduced as later Hesperniciforms. There is still a slight 
deltopectoral crest here and bicipital crest. That's not evident in later Hasperniformes, but still it is reduced. So this tells us that at least at this time in the mid-Sinemanian, some species of Hesperniform had started to reduce their wings. We do find lots of other types of birds at this locality as well. We have Ichthyornis, Nantionithine bo uh, bones, and both of these would have been flying birds, so birds that would have fl flown offshore here to find food. And then we have a lot of other unknown aves yet to be described, um, and these were tooth birds as well. So if we take a look, <coughs> excuse me, if we take a look at the uh, what this tells us about the overall paleoecology at this time. Already previous studies had shown us that we, we do get marine reptiles in this area. We have turtles, plesiosaurs. Fortunately, we don't get mosasaurs, but we do find lots and lots of different species of shark, like Tychotis and Squalicorax. We get lots of different types of bony fish, lots of different types of uh, cephalopods and mollusks. And before I did this study, we did know that there was diving birds in this area. But now we have a much more complete, complete look that we have several different species of diving birds in this area, as well as some birds that were been flying offshore, like Ichthyornis and Enantionithines, and some other unknown aves. So some conclusions that we can get from this study. First, from these 300 bird bones that we recovered from this area, we have at least four species of Hesperniform. We're finding species of Ichthyornis, and Antiornithes, and some as well as some other unknown, Hesperniform, or unknown aves. Passiornis, being the oldest Hesperniform known in North America, seems to have many characteristics that expand our, our knowledge of the early evolution of this group, particularly that the, this species, Passiornis, is much less specialized for foot-propelled diving, so much so that it was probably doing something a little bit different in the water and could even possibly have been able to fly. And lastly, that these cool northern waters from the western interior seem to be a hot spot for Hesperniform evolution and provide ideal taphonomic conditions for the preservation of these birds. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge a few people. Uh, first of all, Steve Kumba and Claudia Schroeder-Adams, who were my supervisors for my master's thesis at Ottawa. And the University of Kansas and Yale, and East End Muse Foss and Fossil Research Station, the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, and the Royal Trail Museum, who all uh, allowed me to look at their collections during my research. To Dr. Uh, Sanya Hanich Furlog, uh, for helping me out with that uh, regularized discriminant analysis, and to the Royal Trail Museum for allowing me to come here to talk to you guys today. So thank you.